And just exactly how we started the, the lecture last time was we were called Green Gym. Green Gym. Uh, because both divergence theorem and the step theorem are going to essentially be extensions of Green Gym. So last time we did the circulation form. So today, to close things out, Green Theorem. Which version are we going to reference now? Flux. flux. Because divergence and flux go together. They're related concepts. And so the flux form of Green's theorem was given that if I have a closed line integral over some curve C, taking the contributions normal, so it's not N, the normal contributions passing through the curve, then that's the same thing as if I'm just looking overall at all of the contributions in the region R that C closes of the divergence, this idea of divergence that we talked about. So in two dimensions, that ends up being fx plus dy dA, because we know that divergence is del dot the field, right? So divergence is which product? Yeah, and then the curls is which product? Well, good. So this is divergence. So this is essentially what we're looking at is flux across C, flux across the curve C, and then we're summing up all of the divergence that's happening inside of the So we're essentially just going to extend analogously the same thing uh, over to three dimensions with this idea of flux. Okay. So this is what we want to recall. I'm debating whether I want to squeeze it underneath that on the whiteboard. Yeah, I'll, I'll fit it. So, Okay. So Green's theorem, we're going to look at it starting with stuff in Green's theorem, and then what it's going, how it's going to be then expressed over in divergence theorem. And so initially, we take a look at all the pieces. So here in Green's theorem, we're relating this R region. So in Green's theorem, what we consider to be R, which is in how many dimensions? Two. two. Yeah, two dimensions. So we got two dimensional subset. So R is a subset of R2. And this is a region. That this is now going to be a solid region D, which is now extended to three dimensions. So a subset of R3 which is now a solid region. So you can think of like a solid ball or something like that. And then the boundary, uh, the thing that we're bounding this region in two dimensions, we call that C, and that's expressed here on the left. So C, which is the boundary of the region R, is now going to be transformed, the, the, the analogous idea in three dimensions, to bound a region R in the plane, we only needed the curve. To bound essentially like a solid region is going to be an actual, we need a surface. We need to essentially enclose the entire. So we're going to have S, which is a surface, not just a curve that encloses, closing D. Over here in Green's theorem, when we're talking about two dimensions, we have the uh, flux. Flux, how would I write flux using the math language? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and well, and then, well, in terms of the divergence notation, so it's del dot f, and then we see del dot f, this. Is this a vector or a scalar? Yes. Ah. So it would be incorrect to say that this is a two-dimensional map. So I'm not going to say in R2, but I'm going to say you have R2. In other words, you only have two components that you're considering this divergence. The only difference is when we compute in the divergence theorem, our divergence, del dot S, is going to exist. We need to account for three components for a three-dimensional thing. And so what's really neat is that the, the way that the, the integrals kind of set themselves up. So if I really just look at the right side of Green's theorem, and instead of writing fx plus gy, and I just put in the divergence expression, and if I say the double integral over r of the divergence 
of f dA, when I extend that to three dimensions, instead of being the region R with this area differential, it's going to be over the solid region D with a volume differential. It's just completely analog. So now we have the triple integral for the region D, which is a solid region. We want the divergence with a volume differential. So I'll draw pictures over here. We can start on Green's theorem. In Green's theorem, we enclose a region with a curve that is simply closed. This is R that we're enclosing. Versus in three dimensional case, if I'm going to then say have a sphere, then it's going to be a solid sphere in three dimensions of x, y, z. So the actual solid part of this sphere, that is what we're considering to be d. So essentially, like the inside. So D, I'm going to have the arrow go toward the inside to understand it's in, it's what makes up the volume of this. Whereas S is, I'm going to have the arrow stop right outside to show that's like the actual surface on the outside. So say the difference between a pool ball versus the ping pong ball. Okay, the pool ball with all the volume inside, the ping pong ball is hollow. So we're just looking at the, the outside. So that would be the surface in this case. So the relationship uh, between D and S is going to be the same as the relationship from R to C. Okay. So just a wellness check. C in Green's theorem is analogous to what idea in divergence theorem? Uh, good. And then the enclosed region R is analogous to what in yeah. B is enclosed by what? Just right. as R is enclosed by C. There you go. It's the same. The same exact idea, we've just given it another dimension. Okay, so everybody can get a picture of this or write this down. I'm gonna erase this so that I can write down the actual theorem. All right, going once. Going twice. It opens for a statement of divergence theorem. Now that we've essentially set up what this theorem is going to talk about, what the theorem is trying to describe, now this will make a lot more sense to just read it off. Let F be a vector field. Be a vector field whose components. A continuous first partial derivative partial derivatives in a connected and simply connected. Uh, region D, which is a subset of three dimensional space. I want a solid region that's three dimensional that is then enclosed by an oriented surface, oriented surface, which we call S. Okay, so before I finish the statement of the theorem, Go back and reference the notes that you just had on the previous whiteboard. And I want you to just take a second, convert all of this English garble onto those distinctions drawn in the comparing Green's theorem to the different divergence theorem. 
Now, you see that every single one of these sentences and conditions is essentially just outlining, describing the intuition behind the difference between extending greens, bringing it up to three dimensions, and then that follows the same. So that's why I show the two separate whiteboards. I break those down so that you can see here's what the textbook would just give you with no explanation versus the previous thing is really what I want you to see. Okay, the, the points of the theorem that I want you to see and think more mathematically about the extension. Okay, because now we can extend and see what the result is if we have a new scenario. So then here is the equation is that if we take a double integral, which I want you to think more of not as a double integral, but just a surface integral, the idea of integrating over the surface of all of the f dot dn components across the entire surface area. That is, okay, before I actually do this equation, I'll point this out. Surface integral f dot n. So in other words, we have a field that is existing in three dimensions and it's interacting with the normal to a surface. So if you imagine a little man walking around your three-dimensional surface, normal, he's standing normal to the surface, how aligned is the field with passing through your surface? So the total sum of me going across the entire boundary, this thing that's enclosing a volume, all of the lines, all the field lines that are passing through on the outside, instead of doing that, that's going to be the same as the net amount of essentially divergence that's happening inside of the volume contained inside the region D, this triple integral D of all of the divergence with respect to D. So where n, n is the outward units normal vector. On surface. Okay. Raise your hand if you got a visual idea of what this is, and if not, that's okay. So I have I scheduled time to explain this as much as necessary. Okay, so now that we have both equations up, let me draw you picture So now, so suppose I have a surface in three dimensions. Okay, this is existing somehow in three dimensions. X, Y, and Z. Okay, so. Imagine this is like a volume. So this is solid. So that region that's solid, that's what we consider to be D, the inside, the interior. And then on the outside, essentially we've managed to enclose this entire region D and we can describe what encloses it by S. And that's what's on the outside. Now on the outside, if we impose a field now onto this object, that this solid object in space, at every single on the outside border, so here is, at this point, here is my normal to the surface. In other words, n is the outward unit normal. So it's poking out of the surface and it's normal to the surface. And then I'm looking at this dot product. How is the field interacting with that normal? In other words, so then if the field is imposed on this, and so the field might be puncturing three you see, of the surface at that angle, then I'm going to take a look at how far away those are and essentially evaluate how much is passing through. How much field is passing through, or essentially, what's the divergence? What, how much uh, divergence is happening, or less? And so if you imagine going around the entire three-dimensional surface, and at every single patch, you're looking at all of the areas where field lines are crossing through or not crossing through with respect to your normal, and that overall sum contribution from the entire, all of the patches that make up the surface area, that's all the boundary. You could choose to do that, but that's always going to be equivalent to just summing up what's going on in divergence inside in the interior of your volume. So how much the field is either expanding or contracting inside of your um, object is going to be reflected by how much evidence is met on the outside of the boundary. Does that make sense? So the sum of what is going on on the inside, the sum changes that are happening on the inside will be equivalently reflected by the net result on the boundaries. So kind of like, okay, so picture this because you're all engineers and you just took like a static exam as well. So yeah. last night you were probably thinking to yourself, okay, 
I've been up late. I've been studying for this thing. It's been a lot of stress. Now, suppose your dog died, okay? The night before, it's horrible. And then you just realize that there are a whole bunch of other homework problems and study guide materials that the professor didn't tell you about that he said was going to be on this exam you're taking the next morning at like eight in the morning, okay? And on top of that, your car, like you, you get an alert on the ORU app that says someone threw a football and it crashed through your windshield, okay? And then <laughs> they upload a picture and it's your car. And so you're thinking to yourself, my gosh, my dog just died. You know, I got the exam in the morning and the professor didn't upload the review guide for half of the exam. So I call it now. It's fine. Yeah, now my, now my car is broken. And then, uh, so when you wake up the next morning and you walk into that exam, the sum total of all that turmoil going on. And if somebody, say, accidentally slams a door in your face or closes the elevator door on you when you're trying to get in, and it's going to blow. Okay, so essentially that exterior, people can't see what's going on inside me. Okay. But it's essentially equivalent to what you're letting on on the outside. And some of us hide that a little better than others, frankly. But <laughs> the idea is you can't hide uh, with, with, with what you see on the outside, the boundary, that exterior is a reflection of a sum total of what's going on that in the internal. Okay. And so that idea of calculus is essentially what all the fundamental theorems of calculus are going to say, which we will talk about at the very, very end of the book. So we good with divergence here. We'll do an example, and then I want to show you something very fun. So we all good? Ready to see an example? All right. We're going to want to take out uh, some paper for this one. I don't want to do it as you want, but you'll want paper for this. Uh, might need more than one page. <laughs> All I know is my handwriting is either too big or too incorrect for it to fit on my paper. Are you out of paper in your notebook? No, I mean, I would, it's nice to have a picture because if you don't really have the pictures, what you're trying to do becomes more meaningless than interesting. This is actually one of the topics that's going to hit really hard if you're going to be doing anything in electronics. Um, because you're going to be doing a lot of this. So, mm -hmm. so let's let's say we have a field. And this field, you know, let's just do something straightforward like X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. So it'll be growing evenly, kind of linearly from origin in the first quadrant or octant. And then this surface, the, the, this volume that we want to be talking about is going to be described by all the points in x, y, z, where 0 is less than equal to x is less than equal to 1, and then y is going to be between 0 and 1, and z is between 0 and 1. So this is a classic way to construct a cube, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, the x component is going to be length 1 from the origin, y is going to be tall, you know, like length one in that direction, Z is one length tall. So if you take every single point in these inequalities, you generate a solid cube with volume one on that rest with its corner at the origin. And it's all the positive values, okay? So we want to use, uh, so we've, we've got this, we also have this interesting field. So what we want to do is we want to use the divergence theorem. Divergence. Theorem to compute the surface integral over s, f dot n ds. Okay, so here's why the divergence theorem is really nice. Remember when we had to learn that you had to do specific parameterizations in two dimensions with two separate parameters for every single possible different surface that you have? Well, guess what? Cubes have these sharp edges and sharp corners, which means you're not going to have a single equation, a single parameterization that's going to do this. Now, when we were here and we did Stokes' theorem and we saw the plane, and so we would have had to break up a curve into three separate lines. And if you think having to do three separate lines is bad, imagine having to parameterize six sides of a cube with the two-dimensional version of parameterization just to compute six surface integrals to get one answer, okay? That's horrible. And the idea is uh, divergence theorem is going to basically say, hey, you know, do not fear. 
because all of these outwards, so across a parameterized surface, all of those normal contributions across uh, the surface will end up just being equivalent to the divergence on the inside. And divergence is almost always going to be easier to deal with because divergence is the dot product. And dot products are way easier to handle because it's a scalar value to um, versus the cross product when that can actually be a toss up whether taking the cross product is going to make it any easier or not. But in this case, for sure, you do not want to solve six surface integrals just to solve one problem. Okay? So is that much clear why we have such a thing as divergent theorem in the first place? Okay, it saves a lot of time and a lot of hassle. So let's actually draw what this scenario is. I'm going to do my best to represent this artistically. And um, here we've got like, Boom and boom. Okay, so this will be X. I'm doing it a little bit differently because I have to angle the picture so you can see the field line going to the cube. Um, man, I should have thought about this before I draw it. Three dimensional object like this. Okay. Um, one, one. On the X, this point is going to be the one zero zero. We all good with that. And then in this direction, so I'm going to make like a cube shape so like right here it's going to be now z so zero zero one or z and what's happening is this is kind of going to be coming up then and that's going to be coming down yeah there we go. that'll be the corner that corner of that cube and then in this direction we have the y so i need to specify oops and i've got Something going like, <laughs> oh, this is so questionable. Okay. Um, I got, mm, kind of. It's not pretty, but it's functional. Okay. And then, cry with the Lord thinks when he sees us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then, this is going to be. Okay. Is it good enough that you can see spatially like this corner back yeah. on Y? And so this axis, if I were to extend it going back on the outside, that would be Y axis down there. Yeah. So not perfect, but you can see what's going on. So that this corner right here is going to be the point um, zero, 010. Zero. So we have a unit cube. And what is, okay. We have D, and so D, is that going to be the surface, like the surface part of the cube, or is it going to be the volume part of the cube? The volume. Okay, the volume, the internal stuff. So D is like the actual inside of this cube. It is a solid uh, cube. And then when we're looking at, we want to find the surface integral over S, that surface, what is S on this picture? Yeah. You guys like wrapping Christmas presents? So yeah, you can think of uh, you can think of the S, that surface area as the thing that you're enclosing is that wrapping paper that's around the inside of the game. Okay. And then um we need to accommodate what the field looks like. So X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. It's gonna be starting on this plane. Essentially, there'll be these small field lines that are passing through cube and then as you keep going the product of all of these and the positive it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until field lines are producing uh, something like that so you can think of this maybe as you're blowing air through something or i don't know man it could be a magnetic field and this is some sort of doing some sort of experiment on an aluminum um cube on the origin, anything of the sort. The idea is we've got field lines actually passing through um, this volume, okay? Now we can really visually think about what does this even mean to find this integral? We're essentially asking to find what is the divergence? How much flux is happening? How much is the field passing through the surfaces of my cube? What is the sum amount of um, flux that is occurring across the surface of the cube, which is going to be the same amount as the sum of all the divergence that's happening inside of the cube, okay? Doing it this way, we already established, is that gonna be fun or not fun? Not fun, so we're gonna use which theorem to- 
It's almost, yeah, that's the easy question. Okay. So let's write down what the divergence term actually is so that we can relate this to the other thing. So we've got the surface integral of the f dot n ds. Instead of having to do that, because we have the divergence theorem, we can simply equate that. That's going to be the same thing as finding this triple integral over p of the divergence of the field. With respect to the, you know, db. Okay. Now, if the integrand is going to be divergence, and maybe, just maybe, we should find what the divergence is. Okay, so you're going to need to be able to show this computation and essentially say, okay, well, the divergence is del dot f, okay? Here's one thing I don't want you to mess up on the exam. If we're talking about circulation, what letter does that word start with? C. Okay, and then which product starts with the C? Cross. So divergence starts with the D. E. Which product? Oh. Okay. Don't get those two confused, please. Okay. <laughs> As it makes a big difference in the way that these the, the personality of these problems, how they pan it. Okay. So the Dow operation, how many dimensions is the Q band? Three. So how many should we call it? Three. Pretty straightforward. So we got partial partial to X, partial partial Y, and partial partial Z. Okay. What are we taking the dot product with? Yes. Yeah, the field. Were we given what the field is? Yes. So we just got to copy paste. So x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, oops, z. Okay. So if you really think about the way the dot product works, it's going to be x components with the x components plus y components with y, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got ourselves partial partial x. What is partial partial x going with? X, y, z. I mean, it's kind of a dumb question because everything is going to be the same. But for the sake of argument, okay, and then x, y, z plus partial partial z of x, y, z. So just don't make a silly mistake taking these. For each one of these cases, pretend like the other two variables are just some constants. Okay. So what we're going to end up with for the divergence, actually, I'll write this. What we're going to have for the divergence is del dot f is equal to here's partial partial x of x y z. What are the constants? Y z. Okay, so it's just y z. Okay. Partial partial y. So what are the constants? X z. There you go. Partial partial z. What are the constants? X, y. Okay. Don't overcomplicate that. Okay. Yeah. Give me a thumbs up when you've got the setup, because basically the rest of it is the integration. Yep. So, I'm assuming everybody after that has in their notes the computation for the divergence, right? Yep. Okay, good, because you're about to reference that. When we were trying to solve the problem, originally the divergence theorem was saying that the surface integral was equivalent to what? Surface integrals del dot f dv. Right, so we're taking a what kind of an integral over the divergence? Triple. Triple, right. So we want a triple integral. 
over the entire region B of the divergence. How about that? B. And the low and the whole, we conveniently realized we needed to find what that about F was, so we found it. And also, when we're going to put this in, we know from, uh, do you have in your notes, the bounds on D? Good one. It's a Q. So what are all three of these for X, Y, and Z going to be? Zero to one. Again, I wish I could say not rocket science, but unfortunately. <laughs> it's technically you can use it to rocket science. Okay. And then the actual um, divergence is what? Y, Z plus Z plus X, Y. And theoretically, I should be able to just say, well, have at it, guys. I taught you how to take triple control. And this isn't even a hard one. Now, instead of saying db here, let's just choose an order and um, just do x. Well, I'm going to do the x, dy, and dz, like that. Which, honestly, triple integration is like a playground for dyslexic people because you read it out as x, y, z, but then the actual order you're doing it is you're doing the z's first, then the y's, and x's go last, even though you're writing it x, y, z, anyway. So, and especially considering all these are zero to one, you just do it every one. I would, okay, when you do this on your own, don't do something stupid like dy, dx, dz, or like dx, dz, dy. <laughs> because even though you have free will, don't use it like that. <laughs> I won't say The Lord, the Lord, it's not okay. Okay, so how about this? I'm going to I'm going to exercise something we like to call faith, I suppose, at this charismatic university, and just tell you that because you because I have taught you how to do these, and it'll be a very very good exercise for yourself. I'll tell you what it's supposed to be when you do the algebra correctly at the very end, but you got to go and practice how to set up all of the antiderivatives, cleanly organize it. Remember, okay, remember when we were talking about the exam for chapter fifteen and sixteen. And when we were doing, like, say, the volume of a sphere, and then it's like, I showed you, hey, this is what good work looks like. Bracket your antiderivative, show the bounds, then show the step where you evaluate, show the next integral, bracket off the antiderivative, keep everything clean. I expect, if not anything, cleaner work because you've had an entire semester to work on it, okay? So this should not be sloppy. This should look really good, okay? I should want to publish it in a textbook solution manual. That's how good I want that to look. Are you guys cool with that? Do you think that's fair? Super easy integrand, super easy bounds. Just give me really high quality work, okay? Um, if I would have given you the inverse tangent of the natural log of sine, sure, we can have a different conversation. Though. But this is yz plus xz plus xy. I didn't even give you a quadratic term, okay? Do good work. Make it, make it, make it publishable. I want to put it in the net uh, when I read this. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, and then of course, make sure you actually end up with this. If you don't end up with this, you got a problem. Okay. You got a problem. All right. So everybody has this. If I want to, when everyone gets this part, I want to take you to the very last thing um, in the kind of course material. Got it? Got it? Okay. All right. All right, guys, I have 16 more minutes of your time. And uh, this is going to be kind of, in the same sense that I am with this lecture celebrating the end of a very fun season, I want you to see this as a celebration of all the calculus you've been learning over the last like two years. Because really, now you've reached a point in your studies of engineering calculus that you could say, I did it.
Okay, yeah. this is it. This is the end of the road for engineering calculus for the most part. If you want to go on further, let me know. Okay, there's a whole other world out there. But so the uh, uh, the idea is okay, the accumulated overall effect of derivatives of some sort of a function throughout a region essentially determined by the values of the boundary. Okay? So accumulated or integrated effect of derivatives of a certain function can be found by just looking at values of what's on the boundary. And that's the theme of all of the fundamental theorems of calculus. So let's take a walk through all of the fundamental theorems of calculus that you have learned over the last two years. Fundamental theorem of calculus in Calc 1, we say, okay, well, on the real line, integral from a to b of f prime of x dx at the derivative of a function. And so the way I can evaluate that is go to just the original function itself and then see what's the boundaries, right? So b of a. So this is the boundaries on this. Here's x, here's a, here's b. It's the simplest case. So you start there, and this used to be like cracking the enigma when you're a freshman, right? And then what we did was we moved into the fundamental theorem of a line integrals. Essentially, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, in essence, we're taking an uh, integral, but this time instead of fixed over A to B, because we no longer assume we're on the axis, we're on just a curve that's been parameterized. What? Oh, and the gradient. And you can think of the gradient essentially um, as a derivative or a differentiating operation. Dot dr. Well, and to, to evaluate it, I want the boundary points of just the original function, f of the point B minus f of the point A. And so now we're looking at, I started the point A, and it's time to try to go to some point B. And then it's oriented, and that's the curve C. Okay. Then we stepped it up, and we said, okay, this was cute when we were young. And then we have Green theorem, which is one of the fundamental theorems you can think of, specifically for circulation, which is saying, okay, integrated effect. What's the integrated effect in Green's theorem? Well, the integrated effect is the integral of all the curl inside, right? So the overall integrated curl on the inside of the region, of the function, the field, essentially, I'm going to look to the boundary. Again, integrated effect, look at the boundary of the function. Integrated effect, we're looking at the boundary, which is represented by that curve C, which forms the boundary of f dx d dy. Okay, that's the f dot dr, it's the circulation. And so this is this scenario. Then. So we have a curve. That's now we have two-dimensional considerations in what we're integrating. Here's R. And then we stepped it up on Wednesday and the extension into Stokes theorem. Basically saying, okay, well, the integrated effect that I'm interested in is all of the um, surface, the curl of the field dot n ds. But the boundary of this is just another line in and we see f dot dr. Integrated effect, take the field and just it's on the boundary of the circulation. In this case now we had like an actual surface. So where this is now that boundary C for this, so you can think of it like a parachute like S. And all this time, the idea has not changed. Integrated derivatives or changes, and then just the original function boundaries. Integrated changes, gradient changes, go back to the original function boundaries. Integrated changes, essentially rotations, go back to the boundary of the outside over the edges. Integrated changes, rotation changes, just go back to the boundary. What we just did today is divergence there. It's the same exact thing. Divergence, you know. 
Now, the integrated thing, we're integrating up all the divergence. So the triple integral, the integrated effect, is all of the divergence over the volume. But we found that this overall integrated effect is actually, you can express it on the boundary. The boundary is the surface integral. S dot N E S. Do you see how it decreases in derivative every single time? Even though we have multiple integrations, we go from two integrals to one integral, three integrals to two integrals, one integral, no integral. The idea. And then here is when like, we have like the, the sphere where the inside of the sphere is D and then the outside is S. Boundary versus the open side. Now the textbook doesn't include this, but I'm going to show it to you as a little sneak peek of what you could do if you decide to continue on in your studies in calculus. And then we call this thing generalized scopes, which is going to be integrated effects over parts of a manifold omega of the integrable for omega is the same thing as summing up over the manifold the derivatives, the, differ the differentiated components. So technically speaking, and what they'll do in grad school is you take generalized Stokes and you show how every single fundamental theorem of calculus is just an application of this. So it's all Stokes there. It's like the, it's all Ohio name. It's always been Ohio. It always will be Ohio. <laughs> it's always Stokes. Isn't that pretty? You can, on this one board, you can summarize all of the calculus that you've studied. What's the integral of the omega? We use the partial to represent, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, the Greek. Okay. That's an uppercase omega. That's a lowercase omega. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, guys, guys, okay. So when we refer to God as alpha and omega, right? Whenever you go to an Orthodox church, and they have essentially the alpha chi omega. And what they'll have in the halo for Jesus is the ha ohm. The ha ohm. And then essentially the continually being one, the continually coming one, the continually one who always is, the one who was, who is, and will always be. And so with these people talk about. Mm. I won't talk about denominations while I'm on recording, so let me stop. <laughs> okay. One, I love you guys. This has been so much fun. Um, thank you, Dr. Harder, for letting me hijack your class effectively and teach everything. <laughs> um, yes, considering that I am just a 20-year-old kid, this is quite a great experience for me. I love you guys all very much. Please, um, don't, I, see, when I stop teaching math, the thing is, I'm going to try to revert back to being a normal student because guess what I haven't been able to do for the last five semesters? Sleep. <laughs> I haven't been able to sleep or be a normal student, okay? So don't be a stranger. Next semester, I'm just just the dance major guy that you know, all right? <laughs> all right. I will see you guys. Um, have a safe break. Come on Monday because what we'll do is we'll do an official like exam for your review and talk about the logistics for what will be kind of what to expect for the exam, the timing of the exam, it's gonna be the Monday after break. Um, but aside from that, yeah, do really, really well on this unit exam and uh, make your lives easier in finals week, okay? Sure. All right. There will, well, yeah, there will, there, there's a final exam for the class, but we'll talk about that um, after the break. All right, you guys are very loved. I would see you all.